What's up, people? Tanvir Amit here. This is Deep Dive, and you're watching episode one with me. Numero uno. And him. This here is Ashigur Rahman Khan. He is a very dear friend of mine. It's not the most bestest friend. And we've been in grade eight together. Like, we start, we got to know each other in grade eight, and then... That was almost 10 years ago. That's been more than 10 years now. Really? Yeah. Grade eight was 2009. Yeah. It's been almost 10 years. Almost 10 years, yeah. Yeah, so we graduated school together, and then we both went to Australia, but he went to a different state, I went to a different state, so we never really met up in Australia. And because we were both broke. Kind of, yeah. Broke. <laughs> and so he actually came back to Bangladesh after four years, so I'm meeting him after four years, so I thought this would be a very good opportunity to get him on the channel and have a chat. So here we are. So he's actually a low-key music producer. He is working with a band named Corrupt Theory. And what do you do? You like what do you well, do for the? I used to. I've been working with this band for a long time, but after I left about four years ago, kind of was on pause. But I'm thinking about starting again. So we have a very hardcore name like Corrupt Theory, but we actually do very soft songs. Um, Mostly Bangla songs, and you know we're planning to release a new song very soon. It's called Shopno. Um, it's gonna be out maybe in the next month or a couple of months. We'd love to see um, how the crowd reacts, and mm -hmm. so if if, we, if people give a liking to it, you know we might be releasing a couple, a few more songs that we have. That, that's awesome. Tell the viewers something about what you do for a living. Well, I do two jobs. One is a sales and marketing job um, in Australia. Um, right now we're working on this federal government scheme to basically upgrade all the lighting systems in uh, small to medium businesses because um, okay. it's, it's a move towards a more eco-friendly environment. So basically we're taking any business that has all the lights and changing them into the new LED lights. So the new lights are more efficient. It's a lot yeah. more efficient. Saves up to like seventy-five percent of your electricity. And what else do you do? You said you do oh, yeah, jobs. Yeah. And the other one I do is uh, I work at a supermarket, a local supermarket, Coles, and I work in the deli. A deli is a completely different experience. What's a deli? Delhi is basically where you get your small goods like salami, chicken, salads, olives and stuff like that. Antipasto and stuff like that. You know so what? Do you sell them? Well, it's sliced stuff for them basically. Is it like a restaurant or do you sell the raw stuff? The raw stuff, cooked stuff, everything. So basically it's, it's a section in the supermarket and you know, maybe someone wants like half a kilo of salami so mm. I take the giant thing of salami and then I slice it for them and I serve ah. salads yeah I get it ready to go stuff oh, yeah, that's, and chicken as well that's awesome I mean do you do you love what you do no I hate it man. so you're, you're doing it because you have to yeah well it's it's not that I actually hate it it's more of like <laughs> It's a bittersweet relationship. There are good days, there are bad days. There are weird days, weird as hell, some of them. But I guess, you know, it's all right. I don't want to speak something that will get me fired. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Okay, I mean, I mean, your boss is probably not going to watch this. Probably not. Yeah. But if you're watching this, you need that raise. <laughs> he needs that raise. Um, yeah. Promotion is what I'm doing. Shop at Kohl's. Not Woolies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so tell me a little about you, your childhood. You know, what was it like growing up? A childhood? Mm -hmm. I don't think I've had a childhood sometimes. <laughs> no, um, basically, I wasn't, I didn't have any friends growing up. I, it might have been just the way I was. I didn't, I, I couldn't socialize very well. Um, 
I probably was annoying, to be honest. Probably annoyed the crap out of everybody. Okay. Uh, maybe that's the reason. But yeah, but growing up until until eighth grade, I did not have any friends, and I used to go to the school called Sir John Wilson, but. I really didn't make any friends there. In fact, I don't have any contact with any of the people from there. I mean, they're on my Facebook and I see them online going offline, but I don't think I've talked to any of them in the past 10 years, unless, you know, we coincidentally you know, run into someone on the street or something. I understand. Yeah, so the first friend I had was in eighth grade. Most of my childhood, I just pretty much spent by myself, you know? Playing games, reading books, yeah, and that's just like my social aspect of my childhood. Other than that, I guess notable things would be like my dad passed away when I was ten years old, and it was it was pretty hard since then. And but you get used to it. Yeah, you do. So. You, know, you you told me about y you not having any friends. What was that like for you? Like, how did you feel? What, how did that make you feel? And that made me feel like I kept questioning, like, what's wrong with me? Like, what do I have to do? And it's a legit fact. I learned how to make friends by Googling how to make friends. Like, can you just imagine, like, this kid in seventh grade, eighth grade, um, or was it like, 13, 14 years old, learning how to make friends by reading WikiHow and Quora articles. That's how, literally, that's how I learned to make friends. It must have been yeah. tough. Yeah, but I was always very self-critical, so I've kind of, I've always blamed myself in a way so that I don't have to blame society. I feel like, to a certain extent, if you, Put the blame on yourself. You can improve yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that that's true. If you if you have that growth mindset. Yeah, yeah. But it did at one point just kind of swerve out of control, where I kept blaming myself for every, each and everything that happened to me. And growing out of that was just as hard as going into like, you know. Like, you need to learn when to stop blaming yourself. Yeah. As much as, like, but you also need to know when it's the appropriate time to put the blame on yourself. Exactly. There needs to be a balance. Yeah. Exactly. People can't always be right and people can't yeah. always be wrong. Yeah, because if you just blame yourself for everything that's happened to you, then I, I think that's a very toxic habit. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was very toxic. I nearly drove myself into the ground thinking that in the, everything that happened in the world was my fault. If it grew, now, I don't know better, but there was this point where I blamed myself for my dad passing away. Why, why, why would you do that? I don't know, I just felt like it was my fault for some reason. Well, what made you feel that, like that? Um, because all I used to hear that my dad overworked himself. Okay. And I felt like he overworked himself for me. And I kind of blame myself like that. So it's like, yeah, that if sense. I didn't ask for so much, maybe he'd still be around. That makes sense, yeah. Yeah, I, and now I can like see why you would blame yourself for him passing. And you know, it's not in our culture for our parents to get emotionally involved with their kids. That's another thing. So even though my mom was very caring and very loving, there is also that thing that, you know, nobody actually came up to me and said, you know, it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. There was I, this I, void until a certain point. Like, can you, can you explain a bit more? Like you said, your parents are not emotionally connected. No, that's not what I meant is like not emotionally connected. Like when you, what I'm talking about is like a parent-child, like you know how like you see like your parent, like your parent comes and then teaches you step by step how to grow as a person. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. So 
my mom, she gave me everything, which is kind of nice, you know, even after my dad passed away, whatever I wanted, I got. Yeah. But that doesn't fill that void, you know, because I needed to learn what, because when, when you experience loss, you need to understand loss. So my mom never let me understand that. You know, coming, she probably was, it was coming from a very emotional place, you know, she didn't want her 10 year old to feel mm -hmm. that he's, he had lost his father. But I think I needed that. I needed to understand that life changes when you lose someone you, in your life. I think that would have been a very important lesson for me, which I learned, you know, later in life the hard way. How did you learn it? Well, you learn it when you realize that, especially in this country, where parents, especially a father, changes how people treat you. So there is a very stark difference in the way people treat you when you have a father and when you don't. No matter how good as a person I am, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, well, as long as when my dad was al alive, everyone treated me like royalty. Not that they treated me bad, but there was a noticeable difference in the way they talked to me. Mm. It's just the way people are. People are fake. You, yeah. pe a lot of people in your life will be nice to you just because of the people you're good with. That's true. That's true. People these days, especially these days, are really good at wearing masks. Yeah. yeah. What do you think... Like, what do you have to say about the state of mental health, especially in this country? In this country? Yeah. Like, focusing on this country, but you can talk in general. I actually have some few personal experience of mental health issues. I'd love to hear that. Yeah. Not, my, not just me, like, people that I know personally yeah. that have suffered through it. And I don't want to name anyone, but let's just say, let's just talk about this girl. Let's call her, um, I don't know, Lamp. Yeah, Lampy. <laughs> Lampy. Let's call her Lampy. Okay. Okay, so Lampy is going through a lot of marital problems. And she, and the problem, the reason why she's going through all these problems is because she has some sort of like psychological something going on basically some sort of mental issue or something that needs mm. to be addressed medically but the thing is if you're diagnosed with any mental condition this country automatically just says you're crazy yeah I understand that's the problem Lampy is a very good architect mm. she passed her architecture degree with flying colors she is very talented she is very smart and one of the nicest people i know and she does have what the only problem she has is she has a little bit of difficulty in knowing what's the correct behavior in certain situations sometimes what happens is especially when she is kind of surprised um, if you go up to her and she gets surprised, she will just speak in incoherent sentences. Okay, can you give an example? For an example, I went to her and when I was there, she was just saying a lot of random sentences that I could not just relate with. You know, she was she talking was about this friend that I met, she was telling that I was doing this and I'm doing that. That's not what you talk about when you meet someone after a long time. You know? Right. So, was it... Was it like you couldn't make out what she was saying or was she saying something out of context? She was, she was just saying out of context sentences and lots of it incoherently. So both basically. So it's like, for example, I need you, mm -hmm. all right? And, we, and you, you ask me how we are. And I say somewhat contextual things and then, but incoherently, so like, you ask me, just ask me, how, how, how am I? How are you? How are you? And so I would answer like, how are you? you have, have you gone there? Have you seen this? 
it's been so long. Australia is so nice. Everything's yeah. really. I've missed you a lot. You see what I mean? Yeah. Everything is kind of in context, but incoherent. Mm. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. So that's. I so she often speaks like this. I mean, it kind of relates to the situation, but it just becomes so incoherent. So that's why I think that she has some sort of issue, especially when she's a little bit overwhelmed uh, mentally. Okay. But the people around her just want to ignore that, especially her parents. You know. They just keep saying it's her fault. She needs to grow up. Okay. But and that and they said you know let's get her married. Let's let her grow up. You know once people get married, once a girl gets married, she understands these things, which is a very bad decision. Yeah, very bad decision. Yeah. So even now they're trying to explain how to do things, you know, in in, in a married life. But I don't think that is what she needs. I think she needs proper medical help and she's not going to get it. Because right now, I'm personally afraid, you know, that the amount of, um, you know, people yelling at her, people saying she's wrong, she's always like this, she's like that. You know, people pointing at her mistakes and flaws every single time. I think it's going to take a mental toll. And I'm genuinely afraid that she might do something horrible that can't be changed later on. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, yeah, just hearing everything from you, I, it actually makes me fearful as well because these things happen and, you know, we have to be more empathetic towards them. Especially, you know, your close ones, your parents. You know, that's, that's a big deal. If your parents do this to you, that is a big I think a big in, in this society, in this, this culture, this rhetoric that parents are always right mm. yeah. is very wrong. Yeah, this is, is. Is, I know we, in this culture, we, you always you grow up listening to all of this, but I've seen that it's, it's, a, it's a wrong rhetoric because your parents are parents. Your parents are human. Exactly. And humans make mistakes. Yeah. And your parents can never really decide what's going to, what you're going to do with your life. I mean, even if you're, I, I, there's a lot of people that become successful but aren't necessarily happy. Exactly. And I'd rather yeah. be less successful and happy than be really successful and be unhappy. Exactly. Because at the end of the day, your happiness is what I feel like most. this is the thing that Bangladeshi parents are just very selfish and self-centered. They only put, put their kids all through this just so they can go to their neighbor and said, you know, my kid's done this. You know, I feel like to a certain extent, we're nothing but a commodity to them. Like people just have mm. kids just to like, kind of show off. Like it's, it's like a brand new, like they talk about their kids like it's like a car they bought. You know, my car can do like, you know, 260 on a freeway or something. And you just, you just swap out the my car with my son and the 260 with like an A plus. Yeah. yeah, that's true that they do have a tendency to do that. But still, I mean, at the end of the day, they do want the best for us. That, I mean, I they have not I, good intentions. I understand that, but I, I, I disagree that every parent actually wants the best for their kids. Yeah, I mean, you can't say the same for everybody, but I mean. The yeah. thing is, you always think it's very hard because I don't want it's I don't want to generalize, but don't you know you should take it with a grain of salt if you're ever saying that your parents always want the best for you, because more often than not, parents want what they think is best for you, mm -hmm. and even if it's good intentions, it's not always going to be the best for you. I know I totally agree with that. I'm not saying that it's going going to be the best for you, but they. Like most of them, most parents do have ego problems. They do have ego problems, but I, I'm saying that they have what they think is best for their child. Mm -hmm. That's what they want. Yeah. I think a certain level of independence is required for a person to succeed. Mm -hmm. If you coop them up and choke them out, 
That's true. Uh, where does the love of your parent like? What's the point? If you, then you don't actually love your child. You're just doing what you do to feed and boast your ego. That's true. That's true. Especially in our culture in this country, which is Bangladesh, you didn't know. It's not India. Yeah, it's not India. So you're married. You've been married for two years. Two years. So what, to you, for you, what does a successful relationship look like? Successful relationship, happiness. And now, uh, there is no rigid definition of that. But it's, what's important is both of you are happy. Mm -hmm. A lot of people talk about compromise, a lot of people talk about sacrifice. I think although they are necessary components, relationships aren't 50-50. People have different levels of capacities of what they can do and what they can't do. Some people can easily sacrifice more and so for some people, to sacrifice a little takes a lot of effort. So, a successful relationship is actually finding out where you were lacking and where, what their strengths are. So when, that, when you go together, you know, you fill the gaps like a puzzle piece. You gotta fill the gaps. You can't expect everything to be 50-50. Because if you know relationships where people go and expect that everything's 50-50 is the relationships that break down. That's so true. That's so true. Because, for example, I am crap at folding clothes, folding laundry, and I will never fold laundry because I can't. She is very good at folding laundry. Okay. So she does that job, and I will never do that job because I, I really suck at it. But then there is you know, things that I can do that she won't do, that I will always do, you know? So you have to divide tasks up. And not always is going to be 50-50, you know? Exactly, yeah. Sometimes you just have to give more effort because, just because, you know? <laughs> you just have to. Yeah. And you can't be too, think too seriously about it. You just do it because you have to, and that's, that's it. You, there's no reasoning behind it. You don't need to overcomplicate things by adding meaning to it. Some things exactly. are not that, you know, that doesn't need to be meaningful, yeah. you know? Yeah. Actions of love can be meaningless. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, like, w I used to drop her off every, uh, at the station or at work or wherever she needed to, but I'm not going to be thinking, I'm doing this because I love her or do th th things like that you don't overthink. You just do it yeah. and you're done with it. That way, because as soon as you think about it, then you're like, oh, that's when you start expecting things, you yeah. know? So it's also important not to expect too much. Obviously, there's a certain level of expectation when you go into a relationship, but you must always be careful that you don't expect too much because you don't, you because if you start expecting more and more and more and more, you're going to be pushing someone that might not be able to cope up with unrealistic expectations you know you might be setting the bar too high yeah you know just because you can do it doesn't mean that they can do it and they don't have to do it just because you are doing it yeah that's true what failure have you learned from the most I think I'm a failure that's substantial to learn from. Really? Mm -hmm. I think well, the way I lead life is that every small bit, I don't see everything as a grand failure. This fails in every single moment of your day and you learn from each and every single small failure. So I see the world as like fragments, you know? Okay. So I, I think about every conversation that I've had and I think about every little sentence that I could have changed and said in a different way. That's yeah. how, there's no single failure in life because, okay. it, because nothing actually comes from one mistake, you know? It's a series and series of a chain of mistakes that lead up to a grand failure. 
So you have to be careful, because if you take out one, you still have 70 other mistakes that probably led up to it. Yeah. You know, there's always a way to avoid something. You know? For example, I pay, if you pay a fine, for example, about, um, no, for a, like a speeding fine, you know? Mm -hmm. You could, so one thing I could have done was not speed. Yeah. Okay, that's one, th so that's the first obvious one. Yeah. That's a fail. Second thing I could have done is I could have talked to them and try and get the fine wavered. That's yeah. also a fail that, you know. Third thing I could have done is get out on time. Yeah. Fourth thing I could have done is I should have prioritized the safety, road safety before my work. So, see, there's, there's not just one thing. You know, you've failed at multiple places that actually led up to the end result. You know, mm. when you fail at an exam, you don't fail because you didn't study the night before. It's because you didn't study at every single point. You know, there's, there's, you do like an entire year of class and then there's a final exam. You can't point it to, I should have studied should have revised or this or that if it was just one mistake that you didn't revise you wouldn't fail you would have gotten less marks but you wouldn't fail it's again you have to see each and every day as a fragment because it's like a collection of mistakes that ends up being a failure so mm -hmm. i really don't think that I don't think like that, so I can't actually give you a straight answer when you say, what failure have I learned from? Because in essence, we fail each and every moment. Okay, that's a great answer. That's, I have no, I've not really thought of it like that, so that's a new perspective for me. So that's, that's awesome. But do you, I mean, I'm pretty sure you don't, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Do you feel like sometimes that you're just overanalyzing things? Yeah, I actually do. Okay. I actually do. Is I have a lot of um, shower thoughts. I take really long showers. This is what I really think about. I think about really unrelated things. I mean, probably like I was, if I would go home and I, would, I might be thinking like, why are we having this interview anyway? I mean, 50, 60 years down the line, we're gonna die anyway. <laughs> our, our life is less than a cosmic blink of an eye. Mm -hmm. What's the point of anything? Yeah. Why do we aspire with our personal happiness when it doesn't even matter? You know? Mm -hmm. yeah. It doesn't matter to a cow or a dog. Yeah. You know, why do we build societies and form social relationships? and then put rules in it that really doesn't need to be there. And the only re reason we have rules is because we felt like we need to restrict ourselves. Does that make sense? I mean, it, it's a weird world we live in. I mean, humans are the only creatures that have to work to live. Can you think of one other thing other than a human being that would work to live? I mean, in a way, animals work too because they have to hunt. That is work. It's kind of, but if you, if you, it's not the same. I mean, we're the only living thing in our knowledge that does things that have no benefit. Why would you watch a stalker? What benefit is it to you? You entertainment? That's the thing. The entire, we are the only creatures, the entire concept of entertainment. Why do we enjoy things that provide no benefit to us? You think about any other thing that we enjoy, there's some benefit to it, you know? Hmm. Do you think about sex? It's, it's, it's an, we evolved that way so we can spread our genes. We enjoy eating food because it's a necessity to sustain life. You know, mm. we, there's, there's so many things that we enjoy, that, but it, we enjoy it because there is some um, primal benefit to us that's embedded deep into our genes. But entertainment, mm. 
there is no real reason why we need entertainment. Or, or mm -hmm. again, the concept of boredom in itself is another thing. You yeah. know, humans get bored. Yeah. You can put a dog in a kennel all day and you're not going to think about whether it's going to get bored or not. You don't think about your pets. Are they going to get but bored or not? But how would you know it's not bored? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, well, with dogs, they actually show like signs. But then there are creatures that don't get bored. They just don't because other animals are very simple. They hunt, they eat, they reproduce, and they die. We're the only thing, we're the only creatures that have to put so many complications into life and there's no real explanation why we do it. That's true. So let's move from failures to highlights. What would you say was the highlight of your life till now? My life? Yeah. My marriage. That's a great answer. I mean, it's... It's the highlight of my life for a multitude of reasons. It's the first real decision that I ever took. You know, it was a substantial decision that I took and it was completely mine that I was not influenced by anyone to take. And it was very empowering, you know. It was all my life, whether it was the school, I went to, whether it was the subjects that I was selecting, whether it was the place that I went to study for it, whether it was the university, the country that I was going to, even to a certain extent, the friends that I made was all based on advice, all based on someone telling me, you should not do this, you should do this, you should you know, go do this in a certain way. Everything about my life was done in a certain way. If there was one decision that was completely my own and my own only, regardless of the consequences, yeah. it's my decision to get married. Yeah, that's, that's pretty, that's good, I would say, because, you know, for me, I mean, I'm pretty sure you, you feel like that too, because when you make a decision completely by yourself with no external influence, even if that decision turns out to be bad at the end of the day, you're still, okay with that you're still at peace with that because you made that decision it's, it's better to take like i personally rather like my, I, I might like take a bad decision but i'd rather be it my bad decision than take bad advice from someone and then regret that exactly because exactly. i there, there's plenty of times there's more times that i've regret regretted taking advice than i have taking my own decision because when you take your own decision, you mm -hmm. know the consequences and going into whatever you're going into, you already know, you know, you're already ready to take responsibility exactly. if that, you know, mm -hmm. if shit hits the fan. You're ready. But when you take someone's advice, you only take it because you think their idea has more chances of success. Yeah. And when it doesn't, when it fails, you feel bad. And, and, and another thing is, it also reflects on how low confidence you have in yourself. Mm. I think people, you should take more decisions on your own just so you can, you know, build your own confidence. Good or mm. bad, I yeah. think we should just, you know, be responsible for ourselves. Exactly, I totally agree. All right, guys, so we're going to play a game now before moving on to the end section of this deep dive episode. So the game is... He's going to wear his headphones and I'm going to play some loud music so he can't hear anything I say. And I'm going to say phrases that he has to guess by just by reading my lips. So, did you get it? That's a weird ass game. It's fun because you're going to say some weird stuff. You got a bubble butt. Red bubble bubble. You got a bubble butt. Your red bubble? <laughs> you got a bubble butt. <laughs> I'm just seeing bubble bubble. <laughs> you got a bubble butt. You're a red bubble. You got a bubble butt. You're a red... You got a bubble butt. Do you work for red bubble? 
you got a bubble butt? I have no idea. You got a bubble butt. Do you like red bubbles? <laughs> you got a bubble butt. Say it slowly. You got you a like bubble bubbles. butt. Ba ba. <laughs> you can give up if you. What? I don't have a correct this song. It's like you can give up if you want. Any, any I point. have no idea what you were saying. I said you got a bubble box. I was close. Can I have your number? Can I have your number? I love your butt. Can I? Can I have your number? Can I have your number? I'll... I like your butt. <laughs> Can I have your number? Can I have your number? I give up. There's no way I can guess this. Can I have your number? I don't know why I saw it. I, I love your butt. It hurts when I get spanked. What? It hurts when I get spanked. I swear you're a bitch. It hurts when I get spanked. What? It hurts it when I get spanked. It's hot and I'm sweaty. <laughs> I give up. Nah. It hurts when I get spanked. Hands up. Time maintain kora lag bana, but man. fine, fine. Parina, okay. It hurts when I get spanked. I was close. It's hot and I'm sweating. I was close. Keep calm and move on. Deep dive and move on. Keep Move something, move on. Keep calm and move on. Is it something, move on? You can answer. No. I can't answer. I can't answer you. You can. I can't. Why, why would I? You just have to act one guess, okay, like that. I can't hear you. You have to do it in one guess, like when I. You can't take hints. No hints. You can. Yeah, you can. It's my game. It's my show. Keep calm and move on. All I can see is deep dive and move on. Well, it's move on. Keep calm and move on. Keep calm. Keep calm. Keep calm. Imp ham. Key. Imp. Key. Sleep. Key. Mm. <laughs> Key. Keep calm and move on. I'm Barbara. I'm Barbara. It's keep calm and move on. I was close. I was very close. Like the last one. I want to pee. I want you? I want to pee. I want to be ugly duckling. I like sex. Ugly duckling. I like sex. Ugly duckling. I ugly ice duckling. Ice ugly duckling. Ugly duckling. Ice no. I no. Ugly duckling. I have fucking no idea. Like I have no clue, like not even the smallest idea what you say. So now we're moving on to the ending section of this episode. So we're gonna I'm going to ask you some quick questions. The answers are mostly short. As long as you don't wanna say more. It's up to you. 
So, let's begin. What do you think is the best feeling in the world? Spending your own money. Mm. What's the most important thing to you in life? Happiness. What's the single best realization you have ever had? We're all small. In what sense? In every sense, whether it be our lifespans, our size, our intellect, everything. We don't understand anything of the universe in a cosmic scale. We don't, we're small in the terms of our size and our lifespans are too tiny to be even measured on a, if you compare it to the life of our planet or even our evolutionary ancestry. What do you think the secret to a good life is? Tranquility. So, how can people find you and connect with you? Well, you can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Instagram. Um, Instagram, Ashikur Khn. That's A S H E K Q U R K H N. Or you can even find me on my band page, which is Corrupt Theory B D. Last question. What is your best piece of advice? For for anybody, I mean, your best piece of advice, no matter. Or what, like fixing a car? No, for life. For life. <laughs> yeah, what do you fixing mean for a life? car. Yeah, totally. Yeah, what's your best piece of advice for fixing a car? Find a good mechanic. It's obvious. <laughs> the best piece of advice for life. I don't think. I think the best piece of advice. Uh, that I would have is never to think that you have the best advice.